Because we sit in Iowa um, and in southwestern Wisconsin and in Illinois, uh, we have beautiful oak, hickory, walnut. Uh, I don't want you to take away from this, and that's why we're talking woodlot management today. There is a place for your sugar bush, but there's also a place for your oak and your hickory and your walnut. Um, anytime we get to that monoculture, we begin to have insect and disease problems. Um, can everybody hear me or do you want me to use that? Oh, darn. Okay. All right. So this is really focused on how do we manage our timber? And if you've been to some of our forestry field days, and I know some of you have, it's going to be like preaching to the choir. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why we manage and, and some of what we do in a sugar bush is a little bit different than what we tell you how to manage your oak and your walnut for, for veneer grade lumber, all right? Um, we're gonna talk about how many trees per acre that we wanna aim for. And when we talk about trees per acre, I'm really talking about sugar maple at this point. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about treatment options and, and specific one of them. And, and I'm going to, I told Troy to pull me off the stage at 11 to give my dad a little more time uh, for his next talk. Uh, because that, the next talk that he gives is really his passion and his whole academic pedigree, which terrifies me. But the only savings grace is you can stand up at noon because that's lunch. All right. So why do we manage our woodlots? First and foremost, we need to keep them healthy. The healthier we keep our trees and the more vigorous those trees are, the more sap you're going to get. We're going to adjust our sap sweetness with that. And, and really, the overall health, we maximize our volume, total sap content, and we can reduce our production costs, all right? And that all comes down to when you begin to manage anything, and you've just read that, it's true. I start that chainsaw up with no clear direction in mind. I'm going to do a lot of damage. And so we always start with a management plan. And what has to go into that management plan? Uh, I, I love getting the phone calls uh, every day because they're, they're different. In my office, I had a phone call. Well, I, I kind of manage my timber. And, and by manage, I mean cut. And uh, my neighbor's not happy with me. I was like, oh, how many trees do you cut? Oh, well, they're out of state. I'm like, well, OK. We call it bonus acres. He had 25 bonus acres. Um, that was not what his neighbors wanted, but he really did a nice job. Um, so the first thing I want you to know is not every acre has to be a sugar bush. And so here in, in the Driftless region, what we're seeing is a conversion from our oak and hickory to our maple and basswood. That's really why I'm interested in maple. Anybody know how fast that conversion is happening through just natural succession? How many acres of maple dominated stands we gain annually in this region alone. We gain 5,000 acres a year through natural succession because landowners are not willing to harvest. We don't have the natural disturbance of fire in our system, which is what oak and hickory need. So by default, I see a system that gains 5,000 acres a year of dominant size class trees that are tappable. 5,000 acres is a lot of sap and it's a lot of production. And so on the north and on the east facing slopes, I begin to see more and more sugar maples. Why? Because they are cooler, they are wetter, and that's where I really want to focus my work. All right. So how many of you know at least in Iowa, that we have an air photo lab, all right? This lab has historical air photos. I use it all the time. And they have some really good photos. And it goes all the way back to 1930. So the first thing I do is somebody calls me up and says, you know, I really, I'm interested in a management plan. I look at the air photos and I start to work backwards in time. And those historic air photos tell me where was it pastured? Was it first succession, second succession timbers? Look at their roads. I then look at LIDAR, all right? 
Anybody have ever looked at their property with LIDAR? It is called, sometimes those images are called, are called hill shades. And what it does is it, it, it burns away all of the vegetation out there, all right? And it looks at high resolution changes in topography. And it's cool. Anybody know what these are? They're sinkholes, all right? But when I look at this, I start to say, OK, I know from this last picture that this is timber and this is crop ground. So then I start to think, OK, I'm already thinking how I want or, or where I want that sap to be out, all right? And I know that there's sugar maple in there. And I begin to see this hill shading. And I know I have some topographic relief there. And so then I can go in and I can draw my stand boundary based solely on topography. So that's the first class I can, I can measure. I can get out there and I can walk that stand and I can say, okay, most of the timber is in the same size class. So I want to manage that all together. It's all sugar maple or it's all oak. So we begin to break those stands down into their components. Because when we're talking about sugar bush management, you don't need to manage your entire timber. You just need to manage where you're getting your sap from. So then what I can do is I can go on to either Beacon or I can go on to our uh, geographical map server and I can get the topographic maps. And then you begin to see different things. And, and for those uh, that don't play around with topography uh, maps, the closer the bars, the steeper the ground. All right. And so now I'm starting to see a little rivulet come up through here and I'm seeing one come up through here and out here I know that that's fairly flat again listening to dad you want straight downhill and taut and so I draw a line in there right where things begin to break and begin to level out so I know anywhere in that gray shaded area if I dump a five gallon bucket of water it's running downhill because sap runs downhill in main lines if I gather sap, I want to walk downhill. All right. Now, I drew the, the stars in there because now looking at a map, sitting at your computer, you don't really know what's out there. You don't know the size class. You have a rough idea that those are sugar maple trees, and that's your sugar bush, but you don't know really what's there. And that becomes dangerous when you begin to make cost estimates. And, and Joe can tell you, you know, how much a system is going to cost roughly uh, by the tap hole, um, and I'm putting you on the spot. Hopefully you can do that this afternoon. Okay, so I have nine and a half acres there. So how do I want to measure it? All right, so this is where the science of forestry comes into this, this uh, matrix. Normally, when we teach our students, you're going into a stand you've never been in before, you want to measure at least one plot for every two acres in that stand, all right? If you really haven't been in that stand much and you don't have a good sense on it, I'm gonna measure even more plots, all right? And, I'm, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to find a random point, and I love this. I, I taught silviculture last year, and I love watching our students start out in the field. We're all human beings. We take the path of least resistance. So if I let them figure out where their random plots will be that they're gonna sample, They'll walk downhill first. They'll walk around the multiflora rose, the honeysuckle. They'll walk to where it's the most open, scenic, park-like area. All right? That's not how you want to sample your woodlot. All right? So I want to put a random point in, and then I want to tell myself, all right, I'm going at 270 degrees on my compass, and I'm going to walk for 100 feet, and where that is, that's where I'm going to put another plot. I have no preconceived notion of where that is or what I'm going to have to do to get through it. It's a completely random sample that I want to have. And so I've put out eight or nine points, and then I begin to take some data. Now, I don't want to, this isn't Forestry 101. Well, it is kind of Forestry 101. But in that Forestry Reference Handbook that you have, that's the Forester's Bible. On page 56 and 57, it teaches you how to do a random sample. It teaches you what an in tree is and what an out tree is. And unlike the expense of getting into sugar making, all you need is a penny, all right? The penny is a 10-factor angle gauge that they talk about in that book. So all you have to take to, you know, with you 
into the field is a penny. And you're going to measure your in versus out trees. And for every in tree, and I'm not going to explain how to do it because I want you to read the manual, what are you going to collect? Well, first off, I need to know what my species are. Not just sugar maple. If it's a mixed stand, I want to know what the other component is. I need to know what the other component is. I want to know its diameter. Now, diameter is important. We have a term in forestry, diameter at breast height. We're all different heights, all right? I don't know who came up with that term. To a forester, it is four and a half feet on the uphill side. So if you're on a hill, you always measure the uphill side of the tree. Four and a half feet, you're going to get the diameter. So circumference, 3.14. Also, if you've tapped your woods, and, and I would encourage you, if you are tapping currently, go out and look at the tap holes. I want to know if those tap holes are not closing in a year or two. We've got a problem. You've got a problem. It either means you're over tapping those trees. It could be that your trees have slowed down and are not growing as fast. That's an issue with tree health. That's a, probably our first indicator that your trees are stressed and that they need something. It's a great indicator. So again, tap hole closure should be one to two years on a healthy, well-producing crown. You also, if you're tapping, you want to keep track of those really good producing trees. You want to keep track of those trees that aren't really producing well. And we all have those. We all kind of identify those. It's much easier if you're, if you're running buckets, all right? Because you just see those trees, you almost never have to gather them. It's almost not worth your time to gather them. Then you got those ones that the bucket's always running over. You want to mentally keep track of what those trees look like. What does the crown look like of that well-producing tree and that poor-producing tree? And that's how you begin to learn the differences in your trees. And every tree is genetically different in that sugar maple stand. There's something called a live crown ratio. And I didn't used to put a lot of stock in it. You know, uh, I guess growing up looking in our sugar bush, you know, we, we talk about 70 trees per acre, and, and that's kind of what we'd hit. Um, by the end of the season, it seemed like there was 400 trees per acre, especially when you were gathering buckets. But there, and I've come kind of around to, to his thinking on that, but more importantly, I want the crown to dictate what my density is. As trees get bigger, and there's more of them, what gives in that tree? The crown, all right? And, and it gives up crown space, and that's a problem. And we'll talk about how you adjust that in a, in a minute. And then also important is when you're out there working in your timber, you want to look at not only how this live crown ratio is, and we'll, uh, the next slide shows you how to determine that. I want you to figure out, on average, on those sugar maples, what's your crown width? Are we dealing with really narrow? skinny crowns? Or are we dealing with something that's got some girth to it? Girth is good in the maple industry. Live crown ratio, all right? Why is it important? If you have a good live crown ratio, above 50%, you're going to get more sap, a lot more sap. So on this tree, it is not a maple, but it, it's a good example of what live crown is. So. Trees are claustrophobic. They give up their lower branches in dense shade and grow up. And what happens is if you let Mother Nature take its course, you're going to have a lot of trees with narrow crowns that are growing up for sunlight. In forestry, the one thing we manipulate before all else is sunlight. So right here, this tree only has about 15 feet out of a total height of 50 feet. That is live crown. Live crown is the only thing that produces sugar. That is photosynthate. That's what you need to tap. And so when we're down into this 30% range, that tree isn't going to produce a lot of sap. It just doesn't have the production capacity for you to harvest. And so when we think of a live crown ratio of 50% down to about here, you're going to get about 25% more sap as you increase from 50 to 75% live crown. I would 
love to see a stand that maintains 75% live crown. You're not going to see that in a natural sugar bush because they vied for space and competition over the years, they're already starting at about 50. So from here on out, we're only going to keep around 50% live crown. All right. More importantly, in terms of sap production, crown width is more of a driver than complete crown depth. All right. A lot more sap if you look at the research that they've done. So at 30 foot spacings, so I have a 30 foot, a 15 foot crown all the way around. At a 30 foot crown spacing, I'm going to get 100% more sap. The research shows 100% more sap than a 20 foot spacing. Guess what we normally target for a, a, a density of trees? Right in that 25 foot spacing. All right, that's all based on the science of my trees are 25 feet apart. I'm going to have about a 25 foot crown when you think of it in all sides, you're going to get more sap. So when in doubt, we widen those trees out. Even if we have smaller live crown ratios on top, we start to influence how those branches grow out on that live crown. Again, the faster we grow our crown, the more, the healthier the tree is, the more sap you're going to get. And its ability to fight off insects and disease goes up. All right, it's not under stress anymore. And so, you know, Dad talked a lot about having those 10 years of annual growth that you're going to cut through. Well, in a stagnant stand, that could be, you know, inch and a half might be 30 years or 40 years. The trees will tell you how it's grown. So when you begin to go into your, your timber and cut down trees, I encourage you to take a cookie of that tree, sand it down, and look at your growth rings. Are you getting eighth of an inch of growth per year? Are you getting a quarter of an inch of growth per year? Total width. If you're not in that range, your stand is beginning to stagnate. Now, how can we tell that without having to cut a tree down or put a core in it? All right. Well, once we get our data, and we're, we're almost there, we need to calculate what our average diameter at breast height is, so our average DBH, and that little penny that we hold up and we count all of our entries, that's going to tell us what our basal area is. So a penny is also called a 10-factor uh, angle gauge. So if I spin a circle and I count 10 trees, and you've got to look at page 56 and 57 to know how to do this, I times whatever the number of trees that I counted, I times it by 10. So if I had 12 trees that measured as in, I have 120 square feet of basal area. And that, that becomes an important number. As soon as I have average diameter and basal area, I can then look back at my stocking guides and tell exactly where I'm at in that stand. That's why having random plots, and a lot of them, are important in this. We can't just go out and measure one plot in the timber and apply that average of that plot to the entire stand. That's incredibly dangerous and you'll make the wrong call nine times out of ten. So let's say my hypothetical and I'm shooting for 60 to 70 trees per acre at a 25 foot spacing. All right, That kind of maximizes my per acre production. Let's say I get out there and, and, and across all those plots I average 12 inches of diameter at 120 square feet, all right? Right now, that kind of doesn't mean anything to you, does it? They've come up with these stocking guides, all right? Arbogast, Gingrich. Uh, what we have are across the top is our mean stand diameter. So you can go into smaller stands and do this, all right? You can go into something that has a 5-inch, 6-inch, 7-inch, 8-inch, all the way up to about an 18-inch diameter class as an average. If you average 18 inches in your sugar bush, I'm up for adoption. Okay, I'll just put that out there now. Sorry, Dad. Um, <laughs> darn. All right. You'll hear foresters talk about A-level stocking and B-level stocking and C-level stocking. A, if you're up here, and let's say we have 
120 square feet of basal area, and that's what's on this axis, all right? There's 120. I come over, and these stocking guides are in your little reference handbook, so you can do this at home. I have 120 square feet of basal area, and I know I have a 12-inch average diameter across all my plots. What does that tell me? It tells me that I'm darn near close to that A line. At the A line, or as you approach the A line, that tells me your trees are slowing down its growth. It has maximized, those trees have maximized all of the growing space that they have available. And so what do they do? They begin to compete with each other. They compete at their crown level. They compete below ground. And competition says, I slow down. We don't ever want to have a tree slow down. So now as we approach the A line, I need to knock that stand back. I have to thin that stand, but how do I do it? How many trees am I looking at? How many do I have to take out? Again, we remember that the IQ drops 50 points when you start the saw. We don't ever want to start the saw without actually marking some trees. So how do we manage our woodlot? Well, the first thing I have to know is this table will tell me how many trees per acre on average that I'm dealing with because I drop a line straight down. That dash line drops down. I've got roughly 150 trees per acre that I'm dealing with. And we said on a 12 inch diameter, I want to be at about 70 trees per acre. So right now, I'm over twice the density that I need, all right? At 12 inches, that's awfully dense. So I know I want to, I want to maintain my 12 inch diameter average, all right? So the nice thing is this table tells me exactly how many trees I have to aim for on that acre to take out. What I do is the green line, I follow down the 12, all right? I'm sliding down. You can tell I've had some coffee. Uh, I'm sliding down to what's called the B line. The B line is where you are still considered fully stocked in that stand, but you're giving it room to grow, all right? There, now those trees can speed back up. They have canopy gaps that they can put new leaves out and produce more photosynthate. They can grow bigger crowns. So now that I've knocked down to the B line, if I go farther than that, if I don't actually mark each tree, I go out there and I just think, oh, that looks like I'm at the B line. If I don't actually measure it and mark it, I can drop all the way down here to what's called the C line. If you're between the B and C line, you're still okay, but don't cut any more trees. What that area, what this zone is down in here in this B and C line that runs across, that's telling me that over the next 10 to 15 years, if I'm in that area, I will be back to at least the B line. So that means in 10 to 15 years, I don't want to take a single tree off of there, or I could fall below it. Once you fall below that C line, it, your production goes the other way. You're creating big, open-grown trees that are park-like. Good luck running tubing systems through there because your trees are now spaced 35, 40 feet apart at that point. All right? The trees will put out epicormic sprouts when it has more sunlight. You can actually take a, a, a native timber that has grown together, you know, that functions as one in the wind, and if you overthin it, that's when we get wind blowdown. The trees can actually go into shock when you take out too many of their neighbors. All right? They, especially in an enclosed timber, when you open it up too fast, you can get sun scald on the side of that tree. And for those, you probably have seen it out there. It's on the south side and the west side of the tree. It happens in February and March. The bark warms up because more sunlight can get into it. It begins to get active, and then we go right back down below freezing, and it kills just under the bark. And that sun scald, as soon as you kill just under the bark, you've killed the vascular transport that that tree needs. So don't overthin, follow the guide. How am I doing on time? Oh, geez. I feel your pain, Dad. Um, so now, if we follow that green line down, if I go to that B line, I'm going to be at about 100 trees per acre. I'm still stocked, but I'm still a little bit higher than where I need to be. This is not a one and done process. You're going to be in your sugar bush 
or your timber, and this will work for oak, it'll work for hickory, it'll work for walnut. We have those individual guides, the stocking guides that are species specific or northern hardwood specific in the, the forestry reference handbook. So we let those trees grow, all right? We've, the average here now is over the course of 10 to 15 years, if we average a quarter of an inch of growth on a sugar maple, which we should if we take it to that bee line. By the time we have to do this again, our average will be about 16 inch diameter class trees. We knock it down one more time, we're at our 70 trees per acre. All right, so I don't want you to go out there, mark your trees at a 25 foot spacing and cut everything else down. That's not how this game works, all right? It's an iterative process. So there we go, blue line, we knock it down, we're at where we wanna be. So we do this, and, and again, I could have just stood up here and said, you need to manipulate the crown, make it as you know, big as possible up to 25 feet and be happy. Mother Nature does not put trees on this earth every 25 feet that we wanna keep, all right? And so there's some flexibility. So forestry is the art and the science. So the art is how you actually go and put this on the ground. And so uh, if we were starting earlier, if you have a, a, a stand that all has smaller sized trees, and, and that is your sugar bush for the future. You're looking at your kids and your grandkids' future. You have more control over the genetics and the sugar content at the smaller size class. It takes more time because you want to go out and measure that with uh, um, a refractometer, but you can manipulate sugar content. And sugar content in a tree, there is a genetic aspect of that. So sweet trees are always sweet, depending on the soils they're at, all right? You can only manipulate the forest and get it to grow so much and have so much of an influence on sugar content. You can, if you're at young trees, do it through the genetic selections, all right? We see most folks in that six to 10 or 12 inch size class already, all right? Think about your own timbers. You're probably here because you start to see more and more sugar maker, you know, maples that are in that 12 inch, 14 inch, 16 inch class that have grown through the timbers that were oak and hickory, all right? And that's why you're here. We can still do the same management. What I tell people is when you're doing a crop tree release, you mark those trees, you give them a name and a social security number and you do everything you can over your lifetime to get those trees to grow fast and vigorous you want to start off with the best form you can. You don't want to start off with something that already has just a one-sided crown or has some insect problems up there. Those are trees you automatically get out. And if it means you have to go to a 30-foot spacing until you find another one, you do that, all right? I'm just saying 25 is an average spacing. And you're going to be back in that stand every 10 to, 10 to 20 years. If you're going the route of tubing, the lifespan of that tubing 10, 15 years, depending on the squirrel load that you have or the accuracy of your shotgun. Um, and so you can time your crop tree to when you're going to be redoing your tubing systems because, you know, we're going to be killing some trees. And if you have tubing out there, it makes it awfully hard to put down trees. So if you're a bucket operation, much easier. Those buckets come out 10 months out of the year. You can do your, your management and be back in and, and not really have a problem. Why do we do this? So if we left mother nature alone, you know, we're looking, and, and this is really a 10 to 15 year growth cycle for maple. If we do nothing, if we don't open that canopy up at all, it's gonna struggle, but it's still gonna add a little bit of new wood, but it's not gonna grow like it could. If I do a four-sided release, and, and think of this flying over this crown of a tree, I break that crown into four quadrats. If I do a true four-sided release and I open up that canopy to sunlight, and I'm talking five to seven to eight feet of sunlight all the way around that crown, I can get about four inches of growth in 10 to 15 years. That's huge from a sap production standpoint. So there's many ways to do it. You know, if this, if this stand has never had any thinning, you're probably gonna go a little bit lighter, maybe a two-sided release. 
If this is the second or third time you've been in that stand to, to thin it out, you can go with a three or four sided release. Those trees are used to being released. They will respond to that release much easier. You have a question? On that first one, I probably wouldn't do the south. Okay? If I do south, I'm going to get more radiation to that tree that hasn't had any for a long time. And so I'll probably see a higher incidence of sun scald. Let that tree get used to being released on the north, northeast, northwest side. Nope. I'm taking any, so I mark my crop tree, and you'll see an image here in a minute. I'll mark my crop tree, and I'll take anything that's touching its canopy. I don't care about the trees that are underneath the canopy because I'm manipulating light. I'm not manipulating anything else here. I want light to that canopy. So only the co-dominant and dominant trees that are touching its canopy get killed. If that's a sugar maple, it gets pulled out. If it's an oak, it gets pulled out. If it's a walnut, I cut the sugar maple. Um, so the, some foresters got together and we went out and we looked at some of the crop trees that they themselves marked. And then we had our silviculture class, oh, Troy just gave me the hook. Um, we had our silviculture class go do this on 26 acres and I sent a student in to measure it. On average, foresters that do this day in and day out and our students did a two-sided release. Their goal, they were told to do a four-sided. So invariably, landowners, students, professional foresters will always go light. That's the nice thing about this. You think you, you start looking at the flags that you've marked and you start to think, man, I've killed a lot of trees. And you naturally, you don't even think about it, you just naturally back off because you're too nice. That's great for the first thinning. That doesn't work for subsequent thinnings. All right, Troy gave me the hook. but. That's what it looks like if you open it up. Does this tree have a good live crown ratio? No, but it's going to have one heck of a good wide canopy. It will respond, all right? Mark our crop trees. I almost always use paint and flagging, all right? I paint my crop tree. My kill trees are always flagged, all right? I do that before I start the saw because I can always rip the flag down. I can't put the tree back when I cut it down. Right. So, just shows you, if I'm going to come in and I'm going to do tubing, if I'm going to run a tubing system, I'm almost always going to put those trees on the ground no matter how small they are. I don't want them to fall on the main line or on the tubing system that you have installed or on the buckets in a windstorm. I use it for firewood, all right? So you have a great source of natural heat. All right, advantages, you give them room to grow. You maximize your canopy, but you maintain the density of just the best trees. Now, you need to pick and choose where you do this. There is cost share available to you to do this. All right, call your local forester. They will sign you up for cost share. Oh, oh I thought that was me getting the real hook. Okay. <laughs> it can stress the tree, and this is the last slide. You can overstress if you overthin. All right. So, I would encourage you. We actually have field days where we will mark crop trees. We'll show you this. When in doubt, come out. The best way to learn is on someone else's trees. All right? Um, and I say that lovingly. We're going to have some workshops where we do this type of thing, where we go into a sugar bush that's brand new. I'll throw it out there. If you have a sugar bush that you're thinking of going into to make syrup and you're willing to open it up to a workshop, call me because that's what the next three years are going to be about, is hands-on learning. Uh, so if you have something that you want, either tubing installed or crop tree release, let me know first and get it on the docket. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over. Um,